Life to Legacy Explained free virtual series about healthy and happy aging continues with Leaving Your Legacy. On the show, you'll hear about the things you can control when it comes to death and learn about services to manage your estate and finance your legacy. Arm yourself with the vital information you need to make your longer life a better life. Brought to you in part by the Chip Reverse Mortgage by Home Equity Bank. Good morning and welcome to Life to Legacy Explained. I'm Natasha Ray, live from Zoomer Hall in Toronto. Less than 30% of Canadians say they have an estate and legacy plan in place. Today on the program, we'll be joined by investment and insurance specialists and estate and memorial planners to discuss how to best plan for a lasting legacy. Our first guest is Dwayne Williams. Dwayne is a certified executive advisor and assistant vice president at CAA Life Insurance. One of his primary goals is educating about the different options for retirement and estate planning. Welcome, Dwayne. Welcome, thank you. So a question as I think more about my own estate planning and legacy, one thing that always confuses me is what is the distinction between saving for retirement and estate planning? Because those are two very different things. The concept of saving for your retirement is making sure that you have enough money to be able to have the retirement that you've envisioned and that you've always wanted. So that's both in terms of being able to have the freedom to be able to maybe travel, spend some time with your, your children and your family, uh, but it's also about the longevity of making sure that those finances will last until the end of your retirement. Estate planning is really about protection. So how do you make sure that the assets that you've accumulated what you've earned is protected from external sources such as government taxes and from uh, creditors. And so when it comes to safeguarding our financial legacy, what are a few essential strategies that we should prioritize so that we know we are in fact able to leave a legacy? So one of the things that you really want to think about is your estate. So if you can try to bypass as many things in your estate, that's definitely one step that helps many individuals. Your estate potentially could be uh, taxed. It could have creditors who are looking to settle any debts that are still outstanding. Right, because I'm going to run up my credit cards right <laughs> before I pass in hopes that my child will have to pay it once I'm gone. Or is that, or is that not a good strategy? <laughs> yeah, it's a strategy we can definitely talk to one of our advisors on. Um, you can look at things like with any investments that you have, if you have any registered investments, uh, unregistered investments, thinking about naming a beneficiary. If you name a, a loved one that you'd like to have those investments go to, that can bypass the estate. They can receive that, that money right away. Uh, if you have any accounts, deposit accounts, savings accounts, thinking about having joint accounts. Uh, if you have any real estate, uh, you can think about having a joint, a joint uh, ownership, a joint and tenant ownership uh, on that real estate. But again, these are strategies that you can look at to bypass the estate. And that's an interesting term. So by, when you say bypass the estate, you're saying here's the things you can do to ensure that these assets go to someone without having to go through the estate process so you're saving on things like taxes and whatnot. While you're alive, you can name the people that you would love to have your assets and, and the things that you have available. You can name them right now and you can ensure that they can receive it without having to worry about it going to the estate and some of the administrative processes that you're going to have to manage while it's, while it's there. <laughs> so what are some of the common errors that people make during the estate planning process? Really considering the impact that taxes can have on the legacy that you want to leave behind. Taxes are going to be uh, something that you're going to have to deal with even at the time that you pass away. There's concepts such as deemed disposition. So if you have a home, for example, mm -hmm. and it ends up in the estate, there is uh, a tax that can be uh, assessed on that. Uh, based on the fact that they would assume that you've sold that house. So the additional income that you might have earned on that particular property could end up being uh, taxed at the end of life, which can then reduce the amount that you can leave behind for your loved ones. Yeah, you always hear horror stories of people who are left a piece of property and then the tax sort of outweighs what the value would have been and it's sort of like a a gift that's not really a gift. So I think any way we can get around that is good. So when we talk about the importance of proactive planning, so I just had you know, a birthday of a certain age, which I will not say. It could be 30, which is what I'm sure all of you are thinking. She just turned 30. Um, and so at the age of 30, is this a time when I should start thinking of proactive planning? Like when is the best time? Because I'm sure it's not right before 
you leave the Earth. So when is the best time to start this proactive planning? I just celebrated a birthday as well. So 30, I, I'm going to say 30th. I'm 30 as well. Thank Happy you. 30th. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, right now, um, you know, one of the one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges that we see is procrastination and, and people feeling that they don't have enough assets to warrant a conversation on how you manage your estate. Um, but you want to have the conversation as soon as possible, and then you want to be able to continue to revise, update, and have a conversation about your, your estates and your plans. So if you start now simply having the conversation, taking note of the things that are of value and the legacy that you want to leave behind, um, there's no better time to start than, than right now. Good to know. So the cost of probate can vary significantly across provinces. So Alberta charges a small flat fee. Ontario probate tax is 1.5% for assets over 50,000. And so are there ways to avoid or minimize this expense legally? <laughs> <laughs> Naming a beneficiary is, is right. definitely one of the more, uh, one of the easier ways of doing it. So taking note of any pensions that you have and any investments that you have. Uh, name, name a beneficiary and, and make sure that that's taken care of. You can also make sure that you take some of the other uh, strategies such as having joint accounts, um, making sure that you have a conversation with your estate planner and see if there's other vehicles that you can use to avoid it. So using life insurance as an example is one tool that you can use. Uh, using trust accounts could potentially be another option for you. So there's a lot of vehicles and tools that you can use. And so I want to talk about life insurance. So I am a CAA member because um, I do right. a lot of like long haul kind of drives to our one of my businesses. And so you know, for me, it gives me ease of mind that if anything happens on the Coquihalla, I get a flat tire. I know someone will be there to save me. But you're also in the insurance business. So I also purchase my travel insurance um, through you and life insurance. So what are the legacy advantages of choosing life insurance? Because you did just mention that. Yeah. I'm Happy to hear that you're a CA member. That's awesome. And that um, was before the Zoomer Cart partnership. So that's that's I just, awesome. You know, I do you want to say that. that? I love hearing that. <laughs> life insurance is an incredibly powerful tool. It's it's incredibly flexible. So the benefits of life insurance is it's a, it's an integral part both for your retirement planning strategies as well as for your estate planning strategies. I would say the four main takeaways that you really want to look at from a life insurance perspective is one. Uh, it's a great way for you to be able to um, address taxes. So if you can name a beneficiary on your life insurance policy, then the person who receives it or the people who receive the benefits of that life insurance policy will receive that and they don't have to worry about any taxes on that. It won't be counted as income. It'll bypass the estate process. They get the full amount of what's in that life insurance policy. Uh, the second piece is uh, similar. You get to bypass probate. So it's not going into the estate if you name a beneficiary. So you're not going to have to worry about that 1.5 over 50,000 here in Ontario or whatever the cost is in, in uh, the other provinces. Uh, three, uh, you don't have to worry about creditors uh, looking to take that money to settle any outstanding uh, debts that might be that might have been left behind. So that's that's completely separate and it's taken care of. And four is the expediency with which the life insurance policy is paid out. So they'll be paid out, in worst case scenarios, 30 to 60 days, but in most cases they're paid out in seven to 10 days. And that gives you an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of addressing final expenses, uh, funerals, cremation, celebrations of life. Uh, if you have other debts that you want to be able to settle or if there's just income that you want to be able to have as, uh, as the individual has departed, uh, you have those flexibilities in terms of your financial freedom. And so what if you have more than one beneficiary? So I think like I do most of my business stuff with my brother and then I do have a husband. So I've kind of, I usually name them both. Mm -hmm. So what happens like if I, you know, pass before them, do they have to like duke it out if there is two <laughs> beneficiaries? Like what does the process look like there? Yeah, one of the greatest things is the fact that with a life insurance policy, you can name your beneficiaries and you can actually allocate the percentage that you'd like to give to each beneficiary. Okay. So if you've got if you've got two individuals that you'd like to share those benefits the share those benefits with, you can make it 50-50 for each, you can make it 75-25. Uh, that's as far as my math goes, so I'm not going to try to do any other any other equation. I didn't, we told unfortunately. You to bring I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Fine. Next time. You do also have the option of a, what's called a contingent beneficiary. So, if the person that you name as your primary beneficiary predeceases you, 
it's important to consider who your contingent beneficiary is so that they can receive that portion now that that primary beneficiary has also passed. So there's an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of how you can allocate the, um, the, the proceeds of the life insurance policy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And how can an, an individual assess their insurance need effectively? So taking into account factors like budget and different life stages that could require life insurance. Speaking with a licensed uh, life insurance advisor. So at CAA, we've got a team of licensed insurance advisors. Sitting down, they'll go through what's called a, a fact find with you. So they'll understand what is it that you're trying to achieve. Let's work on a strategy together and make sure that life insurance is the right solution to to achieve that strategy that you've put in place. We'll go through what's called a needs assessment. So this will really help us to understand what's the right amount of life insurance that you need. So identifying that you need life insurance is, is step one, but how much is the right amount? Is it a million dollars or is it $100,000? Mm -hmm. And then working with that life uh, insurance advisor to figure out what's the right budget and what's the right duration or timeline for that insurance. So speaking with an insurance advisor, they can do a full 360 degree view of what your strategy is and making sure that you have the right combination of products to achieve it. And I imagine they take into account things like profession. Like if I think of someone I know who's a surgeon, like would their, because of what they're bringing in income wise, would they be going for a higher life insurance policy so that their family can maintain that same quality of life or somewhat after they pass? Or is that a different instrument that you would use for that? It's all part of the strategy discussion. Right. Uh, it, some individuals might have enough investments and they feel comfortable leveraging the investments that they have to be able to supplement the income once they, once they pass. Right. Other individuals might want to use insurance to protect their investments. So it's a great way to be able to protect against taxes that might draw down on any investments that they have. So maybe they want to have a little bit more in terms of life insurance. Maybe they have investment properties and they want to be able to protect the value of the investment property. So it really depends on your personal circumstance. Having an insurance, a licensed insurance advisor can help to look at that full view and make sure that you're getting the right product and the right amount of insurance. And beyond just that financial piece, are there any specific policy features or riders that can enhance my ability to leave a legacy that's beyond financial? So there's, there's a number of things that you can look at. From a, from a, we have what's called living benefits. So we have critical illness and we have disability insurance, which you can also purchase as riders on your life insurance policy. When something happens, if you end up having a critical illness, cancer, heart attack, stroke, uh, the medicine is so great right now that the rate of survival is, is at an all-time high. But as you're going through the adjustments in your life and trying to make sure that you have everything set in place, how are you going to finance it? Mm -hmm. And many individuals, unfortunately, end up drawing from their investments. They draw from their retirement. It puts a hinder into their retirement planning. So if you, if you look at critical illness, it can help to ensure that you're not drawing down on your investments, but you've got an insurance policy that can pay those expenses. Disability insurance, if you're unable to earn an income, you can use the disability insurance to continue to pay the bills and to continue to have that income coming in while you can focus on recovery. Uh, there's a number of other benefits that you can have as well in terms of a return of premium. So if you're no longer using the insurance policy but you want to get some of that money back, there's a percentage of those premiums that you can get back. Uh, but there's a number of different, different uh, benefits that you can have on your life insurance policy. Oh, wonderful. So there's a new partnership between CAA and CARP, which aligns nicely with CARP's advocacy and member benefits program. Uh, Driven by good is one of your slogans. So what does practicing good corporate citizenship mean to CAA and to you? For, for 120 years, CAA has been helping people 120 through years? 120 years? It's a long years. time. You guys having a big birthday this year? <laughs> big birthday. It's a good it's a Make good sure question. you invite me. I'll remember. Well, I just celebrated my 30, so we'll, <laughs> yes. see, we'll see if we can get two cakes there. Okay, but, perfect. Um, for 120 years, CAA has been, has been helping people through advocacy, roadside assistance, uh, more recently travel and insurance. And the, the tagline, driven by good, was really focused on CAA not being driven by profit. Mm -hmm. So CAA is a member-driven organization, and the products and services that we offer are designed to keep people safe. So we really believe that we are a different organization. We uh, feel that way because 
we've got stories, we've collected stories, hundreds of stories, of how our CA associates have just done the right thing. So we know that people want to work with a company that shares the same values and shares the same beliefs as they do. And we feel that when we can provide that, then we can make the world a much better place. I like that. And to finish off, what does leaving a legacy mean to you personally? Leaving a legacy is, what is what's the position that you want to leave behind? What's the statement that you want to, that you want to leave behind? What's your why? Uh, we've, we've dedicated a lot in the short time that we have here. We've given a lot in the short time that we have here. And we want to leave the place, uh, we want to leave this place in a better position than it was when we came in. So if you've got grandchildren, if you've got children, if you've got a spouse, if there's a cause that you believe in, how do you leave your mark to say that where it was versus where it's going to be is in a better place because of something that I was able to do to benefit society and to benefit my family and friends. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you. Being well informed about what investments can fuel the future is so important. Our next guest is Celine Sue, Director of Wealth Products at RBC Insurance. Celine is responsible for overseeing RBC's different retirement products and making sure they meet the needs of Canadians. Welcome, Celine. Hi, thank you for having me, Natasha. Of course, thank you for being here. So my first question for you is, how can I ensure that I maximize the inheritance for my loved ones? So what are some key factors and considerations? Yeah, some of the key factors that I wanted to you know, focus on today is really um, planning, prioritization, and, um, and communicating your estate plan. You know, Natasha, you probably heard the statistic a lot, um, but 50% of Canadians don't have a will. Um, and that stat always surprises me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it shows that many Canadians are just not planning for their estate. And you know, they may think that they're too young, um, they're too old, or maybe not too old, but um, they may think they're too young or they don't have enough wealth. Uh, but everybody can benefit from an estate plan. And I, I think it's a, another piece of it is just that fear too around, I know I need a will, but I don't want to think about having a will. So if I don't think about it, then I'm just going to put it under the table and not worry about it. So I think that's another Piece, yes, right. That absolutely. scares people. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, you know a lot of people don't want to think about their mortality. They don't want to think about um, what's going to happen, um, and so they do. They they definitely do. You know, burst into the rug <laughs> a lot of times. So navigating the steps involved after after death, such as wills and probates, can be complex. And in in that time that you're going through, it's certainly hard for a lot of people to deal with it. So. How can people educate themselves about the process um, and some expenses that they may have to worry about or the, or the legal process? So what, what could that look like? Yeah, and you know, many Canadians are in the dark when it comes to what's going to happen to them after they pass away. Um, in fact, 61% of Canadians aren't familiar with the probate process. And, um, and we just did a survey, actually, that, that revealed that. And you know, I was just listening to Dwayne speak, and he brought up a lot of great points. So I'm going to go home and look at my will um, and you know, see if there's any strategies that I could employ. So, you know, hosting such great events like this um, is a great way to educate yourself. But, you know, when I want to educate myself about something new, obviously, I go to the internet. That's really the first place that I'll go to get started. Uh, because, you know, knowledge is power. And, um, and you know, once uh, you're ready to sit down, don't be afraid to talk to a professional. You know, there's accountants and lawyers that can help you navigate the process because it's it's it is complex. Um, and there's estate planners, um, estate lawyers that could also help you when um, you know when you're ready to sit down and plan your plan your estate. And you know, it's important to know about the probate process, mm -hmm. but it's also really important to know about all the costs that are involved. Um, I think people over you know, often overlook a lot of the cost. There's legal fees, there's estate fees, um, and, and a host of other fees that people just don't think about when they're planning their estate. So you talked about internet research, which we know can take you down some weird rabbit holes sometimes. Yes. So <laughs> do you have any credible resources that you would recommend for people who are starting to do research around this whole process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm from RBC Insurance, and so I'm going to do a little plug right. here. But which is I fine. mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, rbcinsurance.com um, forward slash retirement. Um, there's a lot of information there, and you can also get connected with a licensed insurance advisor that can help you discuss a lot of these matters so that, you know, your needs and your goals for the future are, are taken care of. 
And when we think about money and coming from the banking sector, I'm sure you understand money matters are considered private and people are very on the fence about talking about those types of things. Um, so why is it important to have these conversations with your family about your investments and, and their inheritance? I mean, I can already think of a couple, but from yeah. an expert's <laughs> perspective, why don't you let us know? Yeah, and you know, I get it. You know, um, money and end of life discussions are, are very difficult conversations to have. Uh, I mean, who wants to talk about death and you know, think about your own mortality? Um, but it is very important and your estate plan shouldn't be a secret. Um, and I'm not saying that you need to divulge all of the aspects of you know, who's gonna get what, but at least at a very high level, make sure that your loved ones know what your, your wishes are so that you know, when you do pass on, they're not left wondering, well, what do I do next? Because it's already gonna be an emotional time for them and you don't wanna add on top of that you know, additional grief and additional stress. Uh, and so in what ways does being prepared and proactive in estate planning make things easier on your, on your loved ones? Because I'm sure we've all heard horror stories of fights and the siblings aren't talking anymore and there's this and that happening. So what are some of the, the benefits of being proactive in this area? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, failing to communicate um, what your wishes are and failing to communicate um, your estate plan can have some real consequences. Um, you know, when that time does come and when you do pass away, there's gonna be a need for some quick decision making, right? You're gonna to need to, someone's gonna to need to contact your loved ones and your friends to let you know that something's happened to you. Um, they're going to need to contact the funeral and make funeral arrangements. Um, and so you really wanna make sure that there's somebody in the driver's seat to do that, because if you don't, again, everyone's gonna be left wondering what to do and it can cause a lot of confusion, um, hurt feelings, and, and as you mentioned, you know, um, uh, you know, conflict and, and uh, family discord. So you really wanna make sure that, um, that you do have a plan and that you do communicate it so that, um, so that your loved ones are more prepared. And so um, one of my favorite shows is The Real Housewives of Anything. And, and the reason is because I love drama. Um, so if I was um, looking for a job, is there someone who helps with that family conflict? Could I be that person? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Like, is there someone who's able to help if there is a conflict that arises? Yeah, absolutely. And and um, I think that um, leaning on the professionals, right? I mean, again, like an estate lawyer and a estate planner or some sort of counselor as well, because there are grief. I'm not I'm not an expert on that, but I know you know there are grief counselors that can help you through that process um, and to help you prepare for that. Um, I do have a story if I if I have I some time this, actually yeah, to tell you about. Um, actually, um, you know, I was mentioning a lot of the costs. That are associated with probate and I actually have a colleague and she's an executive at her company and she's actually going through that process right now. Her aunt passed away um, last fall and so she was named as the executor of her aunt's estate and the estate is still going through probate. It's been 10 months and there's been a lot of costs that have accumulated um, and my colleague has no access to any of the funds in her aunt's estate because it's still tied up in the probate process. And so she's had to use a lot of that money, uh, her own money, sorry, to pay for a lot of these expenses. Um, and these are things like the legal fees that I talked about. But there's also costs that you don't think about. Um, my colleague can't sell her aunt's home because again, everything is still locked up in probate. So she's had to pay for um, property taxes, utility bills, um, and things that you don't think about like snow removal and lawn maintenance because no one's living there, but you still need to make sure that the house is, is kept um, well. And, um, and so my colleague has actually had to spend upwards of $40,000 of her own money to pay for all of these costs. And you know, it's added a lot of stress and, and financial stress. And I don't think you know, a lot of us don't have tens of thousands of dollars in disposable income um, sitting around. So the one piece advi of advice that my colleague wanted me to I mean, express today was when you're planning your estate, make sure that you have um, the proper resources mm -hmm. and the proper funding in place for your executor so that they're not left with all of these out-of-pocket expenses and they're not left having to dip into their own savings. So just to get into that a little bit more, so my first question, this is a follow-up, so that 10-month probate process, is that normal? You know, it varies. You know, there's some estates that can bypass probate really quickly, um, and, and that's great. Um, but some, I've, I've heard of some uh, estates taking years to settle. Um, and that really, that really comes down to, you know, if 
you haven't communicated your plan to your loved ones and there's family members that are fighting. They think that, no, I have access, to, I should be getting the house or I should be getting you know, this heirloom. And that's when it, the, the, the probate process takes a little bit longer. And when you talk about having resources in place to help the executor pay for some of these, so if, if everything is caught up in probate, are they even able to access any resources? Or are you talking about having like a joint bank account or something with just pulling on what Dwayne was talking about so that person has resources? Like how do you sort of bypass that yeah, issue? Exactly, and, and Dwayne did mention a couple of them, like insurance. Right. And, um, and so, you know, a, a big part of estate planning is structuring your assets and your finance in, in such a way that will minimize the taxes and minimize your fees and increase the, the inheritance that your loved ones receive. And so that's kind of where insurance come in, comes into play and, and Dwayne, you know, touched upon a lot of great points. Um, and um, products such as segregated funds, they are kind of a You're hybrid. into my next question. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, they're, they're a hybrid um, insurance product and investment product that help to grow and protect your hard-earned savings. And so segregated funds are, um, they're very similar to mutual funds, um, but they have very unique estate planning benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to kind of touch upon two of those today. Yeah, um, the first one is the death benefit guarantee. And what that death benefit guarantee is really, it's insurance for your money. You know, we think a lot about insurance, but about, you know, you insure your life, you insure your health, uh, you insure your home and your car, and wealth insurance is really just that, it's insurance for your money. Um, and so uh, I will know that my beneficiaries will get nothing less than what I put in. Um, and so a quick example, you know, it, um, I invest $100,000 into my segregated fund, and when I pass away, the value dips below the $100,000. I'll know that my beneficiaries will receive the full $100,000 that I put in. Um, but on the flip side, if I've enjoyed positive markets mm -hmm. and my val market value has increased, uh, I will get that, um, you know, the higher of the market value or the death benefit guarantee. So using seg funds as a part of your estate plan, it's really a great way to maximize what you're sending or what you're the inheritance that you're leaving to your loved ones. And I'm sure this year is a good example of why Absolutely. you should have yeah. segregated funds. <laughs> I mean, we've seen everything this year, I think. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in your experience, what are some key considerations that individuals should keep in mind when selecting wealth products to align with their legacy goals? So yeah, like, I think what are know, you looking at Yeah, with you know, with any, any types of investments, you want to speak with the, a licensed advisor. Um, you want to make sure that um, your, your specific needs and specific circumstances are taken care of. Um, and, and, you know, if you're looking at new products such as seg funds, you want to make sure that they're suitable for you. And, um, and speaking with a licensed advisor, you can see how how a seg fund could complement um, your existing investments in your existing estate plan. Um, you know, the old adage of don't put your, all your eggs in one basket, you're not gonna invest everything into a seg fund, but really how can it complement and be part of that puzzle? Um, and, um, and the other thing really is, you know, estate, uh, sorry, um, investments are a long-term game. You know, you know, there's no secret to overnight success. And so, um, so focus on uh, the, the end game, focus on the big picture, and, and do meet with your advisor often because you know, things change, and you wanna make sure that you're on track so that um, you, know, you can maximize what you're leaving to your loved ones when you pass away. And so the, the story you told about your um, colleague, um, it, it shows a little bit of the hardship around the estate process. Could you give a success story um, of a client who maybe you've worked with who you know, used some of the wealth insurance products and was able to you know, leave a legacy that was less complicated? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I focused on the death benefit guarantee and, and the estate planning benefits, but there are also other benefits as part of SEG funds. Um, potential creditor protection is one of them. So we actually had a client who's a small business owner. And unfortunately, during the pandemic had to, you know, as, you know, many thousands of people had to close down their business and, um, and had to claim bankruptcy. But because he had invested a portion of his non-registered assets in a SEG fund, they were protected from creditors. So, you know, because he had claimed bankruptcy, they were not able to touch that money. So that will maximize what gets sent out uh, or get what, what gets um, you know, paid as an inheritance to their loved ones. So um, there are a lot of great stories. <laughs> I don't know how much time I have left, but you know, um, I think that um, SEG funds are a great way to grow your money, to protect your money, yeah. but also to minimize the fees associated with probate and maximize the inheritance that your loved, one, your loved ones receive. And what's the story that you're hoping to leave? Like, what does leaving a legacy mean to you? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think legacy comes in many forms. But for me, it comes down to, um, you know, what's the mark that I'm leaving in this world when I leave? Um, what what um, impact have I had mm -hmm. on my friends and my family? And really, you know, passing down those morals and values to my family. And, um, and you know, from a financial perspective, when I'm, when I'm gone, I want to make sure that my family is financially secure and financially independent. And kind of wrapping up, you know, what I've, what I've been talking about in the segment is really that starts with prioritizing your estate plan, planning it, and making sure that you communicate it. Because, you know, the best plans are, can be, you know, can be a best plan, but if you don't communicate it, it, it will fall flat. And we will be speaking about that later. That communication piece is so important. So right. thank you exactly. again, Celine. It was so lovely You're to meet welcome. you. You're welcome. Thank you very you. much, Natasha. Having your affairs in order is equally important. Mark Neal is Head of Wealth and Finance at Clear Estate, a company that offers estate planning tools and estate settlement services. But first, he was a customer. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Natasha. Nice we, to be here. We both flew from quite far to be yes, here. We, we could have just done this from home, <laughs> you and I. We could have met at a coffee shop. Yes. <laughs> so I do want to ask, so first you were uh, a customer. So what do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, what happened in my situation was... Um, uh, I had retired. Uh, I'd retired from an investment firm where I'd worked um, uh, for a long time, and uh, I was invited back to their conference that was being hosted in Vancouver. And uh, at the time, um, I had just been in to visit my financial advisor who had said, by the way, Mark, you know, you have a 14-year-old son, and your will has been made 15 years ago, and you needed to update it. So in the back of my mind, this was sitting in me. And he had suggested a lawyer that I was going to go see. But anyway, what happened was I went into the conference. I came into a, a session that was held by Clear Estate. Mm -hmm. And I sat down, and the, the speaker, who was one of our founders at the time, talked about how the product that they had de developed was a way for people to create an estate plan in the comfort of their home, talking with an estate professional online. And there was a free consultation. So I thought, well, here I was. So I signed up for the free consultation. And uh, after the session, I had mentioned to the founder, uh, his name was Alex, and I said, Alex, I, I signed up for your free consultation. He goes, oh, good, let me know how it goes one day. So um, a couple of weeks later, my wife and I, we had our free consultation, and we signed up for the service. Paid for it in advance, and we then met with our estate professional and started in the comfort of our home, sitting at our counter with a cup of tea. Uh, we went through and created our estate plan. And uh, a few days after that was created, Alex actually called me. And I thought at the time, I said, well, I guess you're calling me because you wanted to know what I thought about the process. And he goes, well, no, actually, I called you to see if I could offer you a job. Um, and, and you I'd had just come out of retirement. So you're I, like, he, what he, better time yeah, to get a, a job? Yeah, what a better time to go into another <laughs> job. Um, and uh, we were looking to work with financial institutions and financial advisors to... to uh, move the product forward and to get it into the hands of more people. Mm -hmm. And so what happened in that situation, I, I, I was pleased with the work that they had done for me. I, I thought the product was excellent. I felt the price was very good. And uh, yeah, I was enthusiastic to take on the role <laughs> in my well, retirement. <laughs> I needed to know the story. So now we all know yes. the story. So when we get into the specifics of estate settlement, yep. so what are the initial steps that need to be taken when settling an estate after someone passes? Well, the first thing that has to be done is, is there a will? Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a will, uh, who's the executor? Who are the beneficiaries for it? It's also at that point in time, uh, you know, starting to gather documents. The executor is responsible to find information. So even if you think of your own life, like you have things that you've got that you probably haven't written down exactly where everything is. So someone, if you think about it, has to begin to uncover that puzzle that you've created that is your life. So where are those things? So gathering up real estate documents, gathering up insurance policies that you might have, car loans, or other obligations, financials that you might. So someone has to uncover all of these things and find out where they are and then begin the process of settling your affairs. So the first step is sort of a treasure hunt of, of sorts. Yes. And then you begin the process of settling the affairs. Is there yep. a way of making the treasure hunt easier? Well, there, there is, which is one of the things that, that 
we do at Clear Estate was we have a, a digital way of collecting information and we encourage people. And, and the other speakers before me have said the same thing. It's about documenting information about where is this stuff? Uh, where do you keep things? Where are your life insurance policies? What about pensions? What about loan obligations? The other thing that people, you know, and one of the biggest friction points for people is personal effects. Uh, you know, maybe there's that, that ring that would belong to mom and I really wanted, but my sister and my brother also wanted it. And mom really gave no directions about that ring. Or maybe she told me at one time and she told my brother at time and others, my sister. Well, let me so, tell you a story. My mother's actually here. She's in the audience. Yes, and, I um, met her. <laughs> yes, and she has a ring that her mother gave her when she got married, this little 24 karat gold right. ring. So what I did was I stole that ring from right. her. So then my brother can't ever have it. Yeah. So is that not what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it's interesting, the friction point that yeah. things like that can create in an estate that right. might be, you know, it could be a state could be worth many, many millions of dollars or whatever, but there can be friction points created by personal effects between siblings and between beneficiaries. And is that sort of information captured? Like, do people usually put that in their will? Or, like, do you write that in a document? Or is that just something that... It, it, it's something that needs to be written down right. so that... Again, when that executor is following the instructions that you left for them, they know what to do with those items. Because if it's not written down, if it's not held that information somewhere, it, it's not available. And that's really what's part of an estate plan. Mm -hmm. So an estate plan isn't just a will. It's more than that. It's creating, a, it's creating that legacy for you and where you want the things that you've gathered throughout your lifetime, the things that are important, and where you want them to go. Right, okay. So how can individuals ensure that their estate plan reflects their changing circumstances? So you <laughs> talked about how your will was done when your son was negative one. Right. Um, so, you know, changes <laughs> in marital status, the birth of children, significant financial right. milestones. Like my own husband was married before me and I yeah. always have this nightmare in my head. Um, I'm getting personal here, you know, like what if something happens to him? Like right. does yes, his ex-wife exactly. has what more happened? say? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's, it, your, your story resonates with me right. because I, I've created four wills in my lifetime. Okay. The first one when I got married, the second one when I got divorced, the third one when I got remarried, and then uh, just recently, uh, 14 years after my son was born, uh, I cr finally created a will that actually has has him in it. Well, I'm glad you did uh, that, yes, for yeah. his sake. Yes. Yeah. I'm worried but, about myself now, but... But, you know, <laughs> in any kind of plan, what the people have talked about earlier, it's like, any, it's, it's like your car or your dentist. There's regular maintenance that has to be done to make sure that it's effective when it's needed. And for an estate plan, it doesn't mean doing it all the time, but it does mean when things occur in your life that are significant, that, that you pay attention to it and look at updating those things. One of the things we do at Clear Estate, for example, is uh, people that cr I create an estate plan with Clear Estate. It's online. It's controlled, com uh, uh, secured digitally online. And once a year, Clear Estate will contact me and say, Mark, is there anything that we need to be updated? Maybe I need to redo my will. Maybe I need to redo a power of attorney or a representation agreement for health. But all of those things I can do again. And, and it's that reminder, right? Because it's not what I did 15 or 20 years ago is just not relevant today. So changing things when yeah. your life changes yeah. is very important. Important. Yeah, Absolutely. updating those documents. So, so just think of it like car maintenance. Right. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I have a or, or dentist, but that seems to be more painful. <laughs> I just don't want to talk about that. I've got to make that appointment, Mark. Yeah, I know. You just I'm reminded sorry. me. <laughs> so how does the probate process work? Because I will admit, the first time I heard the word probate, and I was a grown adult, I was like, right. I don't even know what this word means, and I right. literally had to, to Google it, so now I do know what the word means. But how does the process actually work? Well, it's a, it's a legal process, which is to validate the authenticity of the will, and to empower the executor to then act on behalf of the deceased. So what it's really doing, it's a legal process and that empowers people, make sure the will is authentic and then gives the power to the executor to then begin the process to settle the affairs. And does every estate need to go through probate? No, there's certain, and, and other people have referenced that as well, but not all states, all, all states will go through probate. Some, uh, because the it's generally set up as an, um, on an asset basis, but all estates will don't have to go through probate if the assets are minimal. Okay. Yep. 
So like what I said earlier, just spend all your money. Spend it all. So there's yeah. nothing so left. So there's nothing and left. And then you don't there's have to worry nothing. about probate. The no. problem is the timing, <laughs> That's right? Not the, the problem yeah. is the timing. We, yeah. just don't. we don't actually know how long we're here for. That is not the advice I'm giving. Okay. Maybe it is. So what are the typical responsibilities of the executor or administrator of an estate and how can they ensure they fulfill their duties effectively? Because I'll tell you, um, I've been asked to be an executor and right away I thought, oh God, that sounds like a terrible, terrible job. Because it's, it is a lot of work. It, 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 it is. Uh, you know, from our research at Clear Estate, we estimate that it's over 400 hours of work to settle an estate. Wow. It, it's, it's a Your lengthy Your average estate is 400 hours. 400 hours. Wow. It's lengthy. It is daunting. And for the executor, it comes with legal liability to make sure that you did it correctly. Because if you didn't, um, you are accountable for it. It comes with things that people aren't aware of, for example, such as your name, the executor, um, you're required to secure the assets. So, you know, is there insurance on the home? Has the property taxes been paid? Mm -hmm. Are all the windows closed? Is the plumbing, you like, if you have a situation where the pipes blew because it was in the winter, the executor is responsible to secure that asset until such time they're able to distribute it. So it comes with a daunting amount of, a, a huge amount of work, or it can be, legal liability with it, and, and it's not something that someone should take liability. They, they have an accountability for it. So. And so you talked a little bit about the various types of assets and liabilities that need to be addressed during an estate settlement, but a, a question I was thinking was, if, if you purchase a new piece of property, or do you have to update your will every single time you do that? I don't know that you have to update your will, but you need to at least address that in your estate plan as okay. to what that's happened. So, um, you know, in our own situation, uh, I, I recently sold my house, bought a new home on Vancouver Island where we're moving. So in, in my, um, uh, the will gives direction as to where my assets and what happens to right. them. Um, but I, I you know, I went into my estate plan online, I d deleted the current property that we just sold and I added the new property that we're adding. So again, it has to be addressed in that estate plan. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to do, redo the will, Okay. but it needs to be addressed. That's good, you can save on some legal fees there. So are there specific timeframes or deadlines that should be kept in mind when settling an estate and what happens if they're not met? And I do want to talk yeah. again about that legal liability <laughs> right. piece. I just had a vision of me like behind bars because I forgot to close a window. Right. <laughs> um, so first of all, there, you, there's, there's no time frame necessarily to do it. Where there are time frames though are, for example, for taxes. So again, as the, uh, the representative of the estate, I need to settle the terminal tax return. I have to complete their final tax return. And if I don't get those done on time, you know, they come with interest and they come with penalties. It also, um, it, it, the other thing that is because as the executor, I'm required to secure the assets and maintain the value of those assets and do the best I can with them. You know, if I simply ignore it, and let the assets go on, am I, am I really, first of all, I'm in danger of losing value for those things. So I need to act prudently and quickly, but there's no time frame, there's no, not necessarily a time frame for it. Okay. Yeah. And so what options or resources are available for individuals who want to plan ahead and make the process of settling their estate smoother for loved ones? And I'm, I'm not just saying this because you're on my stage, but I definitely right. think I'm going to be signing up for Clear Estate <laughs> after this. But what options or, or credible resources are out there? Uh, well, I, I think for, for most people, uh, I think Clear Estate's a very valid uh, uh, solution for them. Um, we offer an opportunity for people to go online uh, they give a free consultation for 30 minutes where we'll review their situation. And if we think it's appropriate, there's a solution that we'll do. Um, they'll then meet with an estate professional. So someone that's experienced in doing this and we'll walk through them how to set up their estate plan. And, and, and it's not an easy process. Like my wife and I, when we sat at the table going through this with the estate professional, we didn't agree on everything. But at least we had the discussion and we went through the process to go through it. You know, so all of my assets, all of my uh, documentation, everything is uploaded and secured in a digital vault. Uh, I can update that periodically by going, I can log on and change it and adjust it. I can send a note to my estate professional, they can add to it. So that's an alternative. At the same time, you can meet with, you know, financial planners. Some financial planners do a good job of housing this. Some insurance agents and stuff will do a good job of housing this. But I think the important thing is for people to have a discussion with someone 
about it and work towards establishing that. You know, the, uh, someone earlier again referenced that, you know, less than 50% of Canadians have a will. Um, you know, it, that, that's a start, yeah. but documenting where these things are. You know, we didn't even talk about, but, but you know, people dying. Like, what about minor, what, where there's a situation where children are involved and they're still minors? Uh, and the other one that's another friction point for people, pets. <laughs> where, where does the dog go? Where does I, the cat go? I talk about my cat a lot, yeah. but I, I have heard there's a, <laughs> there's a charity that exists. Um, it's yeah. called My Grandfather's Cat, and it's actually for if you pass away and you have a pet and they help to rehome that pet because yes. it is they're part of our families right. like they don't just go free right but it's another thing that people can address yeah. and talk about yep and so i wanted to end um, by asking what does legacy mean to you what are you hoping your story is at the end of all of this well i, I think I, I define estate planning as the art of dying neatly mm -hmm. ah. uh, it's really but for me legacy means a contribution to uh making sure my family is secured. I have, a, I have a son, young son, I have a wife, I wanna make sure that they're taken care of. I wanna make sure that my community benefits. I wanna make sure that there's a legacy left within my community uh, to charitable organizations that have been important to me, uh, to institutions like my former, my, where I graduated from university, to make sure that my, my university that educated me, gave me so many of the opportunities I've had in life has benefited. So legacy is really about that, it's about community. It is about family and it is about charity. I like that answer. Thanks. Well, thank you. It was lovely yeah. speaking with you Pleasure. today. Thank you. How do we turn an ordinary life into an extraordinary legacy? We have to consider how and when we use our money. Patty Lovett Reed brings a wealth of financial experience to the role of chief financial commentator for Home Equity Bank. She was formerly a senior Canadian banking executive as well as a regular financial commentator and host of her own TV show. Welcome, Patty. Hi, Natasha. It's Thanks be for an having me. Easy interview. Oh, ooh, okay, okay. <laughs> let's, well, let's see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. So, how has the perspective on inheritance shifted in recent years? So, are more people still wanting to provide support to their heirs while they're still alive versus mm -hmm. after they go? You know, it is interesting because I've been in this business for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and there has been a, tra a transition go on. What I can tell you is, and it's a line that was said to me by someone who actually reached out to me on Instagram, and they said, I don't want to die the richest person in the graveyard. And, and I thought about that, but what they really meant when we explored it further was they wanted to leave a legacy that was beyond money. And you know, you've had great guests on and we've talked about the legacy and how you leave things. And if you set it up right, you think about the tax considerations, you actually go a step further and you communicate it. Um, many have told me that's the easy part. The legacy that they wanna live and they wanna see is the enjoyment that their heirs will get from some of their life work and the money they've accumulated, but it's about experience, about who they are. Um, and, and that's become more and more important. And so when we talk about the concept of the bank of mom and dad, <laughs> my mom over there, I love using her bank account. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have children like that as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How can it be a valuable way to elevate your legacy? And again, talking about that like living piece of the legacy and then also sure. after. You know, it is very interesting uh, what's going on here in Canada. We have a lot of people who bought homes years and years and years ago, and they have a lot of equity built up in their home, but they may not have a lot of assets. You can't eat a brick in retirement. And part of the reason I joined the home equity uh, team was because I all of a sudden found there was a solution mm -hmm. for people. And it was, to be honest with you, not a solution that I ever looked at before when I was a senior vice president at a bank. I kind of thought, mm, taking equity out of your home, I'm not so sure that makes sense. And then as I started to explore it, I realized that people want to take equity out of their home, some, in some cases, to live, to satisfy debts. But to your point, to help be the bank of mom and dad, to help their children get a home, 
or if they're grandparents to put their children through a post-secondary education or their children's children through, depending on the age. So it's fascinating to me that they have access to resources that they maybe never thought they did, and that's an important part of a legacy. I think it's a huge part of a legacy. Like I remember once telling, um, I think it was my cousin or a friend who was having a baby, I said, I think the best thing you can do is buy like a pre-sale condo or, or a piece of, or an investment when the baby is born. You know, something that's not too expensive, but it's yeah. gonna help build that legacy. And it's something yeah. that when they turn 18, like we're, because of where we live, will be worth a, a lot of money. And, and I think, I'm sure you know what the stats are, that there's the percentage of people who are buying their first home and the gift that they get from their mm -hmm. parents, like it's a lot of people, but that's a huge part of a living legacy. It is very much because also the parents get to enjoy um, their life work through their family, through their children. You know, I am the least popular grandparent going. We have six grandchildren. I don't believe that. No, no, I we don't have believe six that. grandchildren, <laughs> all under the age of four, just for the record. Uh, five boys and one girl, but that's not what this is about. Um, why am I the least popular? Because. I, I know they don't need another toy, mm -hmm. a designer outfit. They don't. Well, we all need more designer outfits. Well, uh, okay, let's be we? fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, okay, As you I, and I, I sit on the world, like, we don't need like, more clothing. Let's, let's, let's put that in perspective. <laughs> but what they will need is an education. Right. And so my husband and I decided, as part of our legacy, that for every Christmas and birthday and holiday or special occasion, we put money into a registered education savings plan for them because to us, that's part of our legacy. But not only that, you know you how you've, said, you've heard people say, it's about quality of time. No, I don't agree with that. Right. I think it's quantity of time. It is the little things that I want our grandchildren to um, remember me by. And so, for example, we have a family cottage. And our little guy who's two, almost three, who is mini me, um, it's so funny because what I often think is that, um, what do you want to do? Do you want to go out on the boat? Do you want to go to the cottage? Da, 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 da. And so when I ask him at the end of a weekend when he's been at the cottage, what was so great about it? What did you enjoy, Sam? And he, he just looks at me and he goes, when we went for a walk, and, th and this is, he's two and a half, and this is how he speaks, when we went for a walk and we saw the beaver dam, and we talked about, I don't even know if it was a beaver dam. I told him it was. And then we talked about beavers and then we looked it up. He'll never fact check it, so uh, you know, fine. And that's exactly it's, what yeah. I'm counting on. He's what, a pretty two? smart little guy. <laughs> but, but my point is, it's the little things. It is. It's about the family experiences and it's being present. And it's not just on the holidays. Um, it is so much more than that. And so when you have financial flexibility in your life, it frees you up to do the things that give your life more balance and meaning. And so you build the legacy. I talk to people about it, and they say to me all the time, it is, it is being present, it's being part of their life, and I never realized I could take some of the equity out of my home to allow me that financial freedom to have the family cottage, to do the family vacation, to go and see my children, it could be on a more regular basis, particularly if they're out of town. And so to me, that is very, very powerful. It really stuck with me. And even um, going back to the, the RESP, the Registered mm -hmm. Education Savings Plan, yeah. like my mother worked at a bank, my dad worked at a mill, and it was the best thing they could have done for yes. me for my undergrad. And of course, when my master's came around, they're like, you're working, you can pay for that yourself. Yeah, yeah, well, but, like, I mean, come know. on, I get that, right? There comes a point, enough already. But it's, no, it's a but big help. True. yes. And, it's, and, you know, when I went to school a bazillion years ago, tuition was a lot cheaper, but I think that's one of the best things you could do. But I do want to talk about yes. memories, because even with my own stepson, like, he's almost 15, and for him, that family time is so important and so family vacations yeah. and shared experiences with children and grandchildren are, are cherished memories as you spoke about so how can individuals again leverage their resources to create these legacy moments so like what are some of the legacy moments that you've created like the fake beaver dam <laughs> well, thank you that's what I'm now going to be remembered for <laughs> you know it's um it's sitting down with our uh, grandson who's eight months old and me going, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And now he's clapping his hands, in case anybody didn't know that. 
based on how I just sung it. But, you know, it is, it, that's what it's about. It is, it is all about those memories. It's having the flexibility in your life that maybe if you've worked full time and you'd like to go part time because you still want to bring money in, mm -hmm. but you want to have that time to go to soccer, to go to their swimming lessons, uh, to be the cheerleader on the sideline saying, you got this. But it's also about teaching them things. You know, when you think about boomers, they have tremendous experience. They've traveled more. They've experienced more. They want to do more. And they want to share more. Yes. And it's about sharing more. And every family is going to be different. And, and how we deal with each of our grandchildren and even our own children. We have four adults uh, that are all married and in relationships. And so different children get things at different times. But it is about equality. It's about your values. And it's also giving back to charity. And... Uh when you talk about the charity piece, like mm -hmm. what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. It, you know, it has evolved because what might have been a blanket motherhood statement, um, I am going to write a check of X amount of dollars to this particular charity. It's since evolved because we've had an opportunity through life to say, okay, these are our values. This is what we care about. This is what has impacted our life. This is how we can communicate it to the charity, what is to come down the road. Um, we like to give of ourselves, And sometimes it can change on an annual basis. You can see something going on or share it with your family and let them get involved in it as well. And sometimes it's about helping in your own backyard or it's about doing something on a global basis. Very quickly, I can tell you, there was a small business owner in our neighborhood that we knew wasn't going to make it. We didn't want to make a big deal out of it, but we tried to help them financially, and, and we did, and they did make it. But what I found most fascinating was communicating that to our adult children. Here's what we have done for this family. And we're not telling you for any other reason other than, you know, this is what we're doing. Here's what they did. They all came back and said, we'd like to contribute. Different amounts, right. smaller amounts, but it's all about the life lesson. Mother's Day, I ran a 10K. Good for you. Uh, thank you very much. I if was I'm very ever running, please know you should also be running because I'm running away from something. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay, fair. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Just join well, me. Well, but here's the thing. For Mother's Day this year, it was a Sporting Life 10K. I said to my family, I do not want a gift from you. Well, I do, but I don't expect a gift because what I'd really like you to do is donate to Campfire Circle for children with cancer or severe illness so they can go away for a week. We all have children. You have children. And that, to me, means a lot. And that's what they did. And so, again, it's about brokering in the values of giving back, how you give back, and I get back to my statement that when you have a little financial flexibility, that's where all of a sudden your life has a lot more balance and meaning. So one of the things I want to talk about um, that people don't often think about when we think about legacy is a vacation home. And so <laughs> yes, it's, it's at top of mind for me because my brother and I actually just finished building a vacation home in the interior of BC. Um, and it's for us, we saw it as a place, you know, for our family to go. And my parents are both retired. My dad was super involved for the whole process because we did the build ourselves. But, you know, it's, sort of, it's, it's a different thing to think about when you think of leaving a legacy. And, and I know we had spoken mm -hmm. about it in some of our pre-meetings. So could yeah. you speak a little bit about I, how a vacation home can help you leave a legacy? Well, you know, to me, that takes... Um, uh, life from an ordinary to extraordinary because it's in those moments it's sitting on the dock and having a conversation or a cup of coffee and just chatting about about life mm -hmm. you know um, one of the things and you've got the book beside you so I'm so glad you have home run there I do I love this book but I didn't always and so when it was written by Yvonne uh, and, and her co-author Steve I thought it was fascinating because she asked me if I would contribute to the book and this was before I was involved with home equity and I said well you can lift anything off the internet as we've been talking because I'm often quoted out there and use it Nothing else was ever said about it. Then I joined the company as their chief financial commentator, and they said, you might want to read this book. So I did, from cover to cover, to really understand the product. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that I always thought people took equity out of their home because they were living very close to the margin, and they needed it. No, they do it 
to build the family vacation, to send the children to uh, post-secondary education, to do the family vacation, all of these things. There are so many reasons. And by the way, I was in the book. I'm on the plane, literally going on vacation, going, oh my gosh, I now, it's almost like telegraphing. Yeah. I'm in this book saying something now I truly understand and yeah. believe that it took a while for me to embrace. And I now get that this is the right product for the right person that wants to build a legacy. And that legacy is personal, it's so personal. I actually received a copy of this book um, during our last filming and, and did start reading it on the plane on the ride home. And it's great because it does start to give amazing stories and, and ways of you know leaving that legacy right. in different ways. And I do wanna let everyone know in the audience with us today and online that you can get a free copy of the book. Yes, free. Um, so you can call a phone number that we have here. So it's 1-833-357-2447. And I'll repeat that, 1-833-357-2447. I do, I'm not I Oprah, but I do recommend the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I also recommend it. And I want to be Oprah, but that's okay. No, Don't we all? Uh, yeah, right. Don't we all? Okay. <laughs> so I did want to ask, um, yes. as we started talking about the book, the Chip Reverse Mortgage offers an opportunity to improve one's quality of life while maintaining title on an asset. Right. That can also leave a financial legacy. So how does that product work? So we've talked about it. We've kind of dipped into dipped it into a little it. bit. You know, if you're over the age of 55, uh, you can take up to 55% of the value of your home out, and you can stay in your home. And there has been so much research, particularly coming out of COVID, that many want to stay in their home. Mm -hmm. And it's their home. Yeah. And when you talk about the legacy and the memories, it is, it's, all, it's all of that. And, and so it's one of those products that people have shied away from because they haven't understood it. But I think now when we look at real estate prices, uh, you look at the fact that inflation is high, uh, debt levels are high, and I've looked at it for seniors, um, and it continues to go higher and higher. And some of the red flags for seniors, you may have a parent and you don't know their exact financial situation, it's when they start to withdraw from family events, especially if you have to bring a gift to a grandchild and you simply don't have the money or you don't have the money to socialize. And so there are products that we call sunset products and sunrise products, at least in my mind. And this is one that is coming into its own, very much in vogue because it's the right product at the right time for the right person. And that's, that's honestly why I decided to join. And so you touched on it a little bit, but how does one sort of balance their own financial security mm. with leaving that legacy? Because yes. there's, it's, it's a bit of a song and dance. Like, okay, I can start pulling out now, but then what, what if, if I live I, too long? <laughs> yeah, what if I what live, if too, I live long? too darn long? And yeah, yeah and, that's, and that can be an issue. But what I also forgot when I was trying to figure out all the numbers, and I did write a piece called, It's Time to Reverse Your Thoughts on Reverse Mortgages because your home continues to appreciate. And so if you want to leave a financial legacy, it's still there. Let's say down the road, you have to leave your home. Mm -hmm. You may not want to, but you have to. You still have equity in your home because healthcare can be a huge cost down the road. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that element of it. But I don't think there is a child out there that would ask realistically their parent to compromise their lifestyle so that they could go buy a home, for example. And in fact, I, I, I am on Instagram. You and I are gonna connect. Yes. <laughs> and, and one of the things I do weekly is Ask Patty. And just yesterday on one of my Ask Patty segments, someone said, how do I balance helping my children out to buy their home and my own retirement? And I, and I responded by saying, you know, understanding how much money you have, where your money's coming from in retirement, what it is you want to spend your money on. And let's not forget, we could spend a third of our life in retirement. And so we might live much longer or maybe too darn long. Yeah. We may live much longer than we thought. So it is balancing the two out. But what I'll tell you is it's not an either or, it's an and. Right. But you do it when you understand your options and your numbers. I always say I'm here for a good time, not a long time. <laughs> Um, so. Why does your mother keep shaking her head over there? I'm just asking yeah. the question. Yeah. 
<laughs> she, She's heard it before. My, my husband always says, do you ever notice your parents look at you like you're an alien? I'm like, yeah, I've, I've seen it. I've, <laughs> they've I felt known it. Known them my whole life. You can see it, I can feel it, because I can't really turn around, but I know you see it. Mm -hmm. I see so it. I are see there it. any <laughs> restrictions or limitations on how the funds from a reverse mortgage can be used to support legacy goals? Like, what if I no. say, I want to take all my money out and build a cat sanctuary in Bali? Okay. No. Yeah. Well, you could do you that. You weren't expecting that, I, right? I, I, no, didn't, I honestly no, didn't yeah. see that one really coming. Threw you I'm for thinking a loop of there. taking our family to Disney World. I'd like, okay, we're just on different planes <laughs> here. Um, but you know what? No, that's the flexibility of this particular product, um, because it's it's in essence your money, and you get to decide what you're going to do with it. Right. And you know, people will often say, but there are costs and there are fees. And, and yes, there are costs, but there are costs to every product, every service out there. And that's okay. And even when you know people feel like, oh my goodness, it's too expensive. Is it more expensive than the cost of missing out on a memory? And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't want to sound motherhood by saying it that way, but I, as you progress through life, you realize that there is so much more that you want to do and that you want to share. And so um, I get back to you. You could build that sanctuary if you choose to do oh, so. Thank you. That was yeah. so nice. Well, My but, first donation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, put, let me put the other context around it. Did I mention the age of 55? I'm just going to say. I just turned 55, so that's perfect. No, you did not. I did not. No, I did no. not. <laughs> you did not. So I, I do we already heard you're 30. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just turned 30. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm getting caught in all my lies now. So I did want to wrap this up yes. by asking the question I've asked everyone. What is your story, and what is the legacy that you're hoping to leave? You know, I, I just want the, our family, uh, specifically our family, and, and our extended family, to know that I cared, mm -hmm. that I wanted to be present, and that I did everything I could so that it wasn't about the numbers. It's not about the financial legacy. It's going to be about the memory. It's going to be about the lessons that I teach them. It's going to be about the things I get to experience with them. I am going to look after the financial side, the charitable side, but it's up to us to deal with the human side. Thank you. And I do, before I wrap up, just want to remind everyone about the I book. Like the, bo hold the book. The book. The book. So you can phone one 357 2447 That's one 357 2447 to get your free copy. Thank you so much Natasha, for joining me for today. Me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Having time to build up the memory bank is one of the greatest gifts of life. But do we have any control over our allotted time? Dr. Kelly Metcalf is the Associate Dean of Research at Bloomberg University at U of T and a senior scientist at Women's College Research Institute, focusing on the prevention and treatment of hereditary cancers. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And you came through the Canadian Cancer Society, and I told yes. you during our call that was my first job out of university. Yes, was with the Cancer world. Society. <laughs> so we've come full circle. So could you start by providing an overview of the current understanding of hereditary cancers and the role of genetic factors in their development? Because I remember when I was with the Cancer Society, I think it was like 7% of cancers that were attributed to genetics. Has that number changed yeah. or is it about the same? I mean, we've made a lot of progress in 25 years when we're thinking about genetics and cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly involved with breast and ovarian cancer. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And it's important to know because we can use genetic information to identify who's at very high risk of developing cancer and then work with those individuals to manage that cancer risk. So we can actually almost eliminate the chance that that person will develop cancer in their lifetime. And really this is the importance of family and thinking about understanding the genetics because when we think about these genetic, what we call mutations in these particular genes, these mutations are passed down from generation to generation. So if your mother has a mutation in one of these cancer predisposition genes, and some of the most common genes that we talk about are BRCA1 and BRCA2, and it's been, they, there have been a lot of media attention to these genes. But if there is a mutation in either your mother or your father, because they can be passed down from men as well, okay. there's about a 50% chance with every pregnancy that that child has also inherited that genetic mutation and is at a very high risk of developing cancer. 
So when we're thinking about BRCA1 and BRCA2, it's up to an 80% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And that's compared to about a 12% risk in the general population, so very high risk of cancer. We see these cancers at a younger age often. And there's also the risk of ovarian cancer, up to a 40% risk of ovarian cancer, which is often a very deadly cancer. And these are cancers that we can't do a good job of screening for. So we want to prevent them from ever happening. And so you talked about research um, yes. and advancements. So what are some of the most significant advancements or breakthroughs in the prevention and treatment of hereditary cancer that have occurred in the last few years? Uh, great question. And when I started uh, in this area of research, we had just discovered these genes. So we were seeing patients in our clinics and saying, you have this really high risk, but we're not really sure what you should do about it, mm -hmm. uh, which was very distressing for these individuals. So we have made a lot of progress in thinking about how to prevent these cancers and how there are effective options out there, surgical options, as well as medical options, medications. But we're also now looking at the genetics when we're thinking about the treatment of cancers. Oh. So there are certain drugs out there now that target some of these genetic mutations, and we see much improved survival rates in individuals with cancers who have these genetic mutations. So there's so much. So we're thinking about the benefit for the patient with cancer, as well as his or her relatives who can benefit from this genetic information and prevent cancers from happening. So it's, it's often a gift that someone can give their entire family by having genetic testing and knowing whether or not they have one of these genetic mutations. We actually had a guest on one of our previous shows who came from another company um, called Inagene, where they do testing on your DNA to then see which medications work yes. or don't work yes. for your genetic code. So it's, it's nice yes. to know that it's yes. sort of in the cancer area too. Mm -hmm. And is there a cost to that kind of testing or is it something that's covered under yeah, your Across Canada, plan? it is part of our provincial healthcare systems. However, you do have to meet criteria. So we're often looking at the types of cancer in your family. If we see breast and ovarian cancer in the same family, it's often a, a cue to us that there may be something going on. We look at the number of cancers within a family. We look at the age of onset of cancer because often these cancers are diagnosed at a younger age. And we also look at ethnicity because there are certain ethnic groups that have a higher chance of having one of these genetic mutations. And the Ashkenazi Jewish population is the most um, common ethnic group that we think about because they do have a higher rate of having these genetic mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So in your research, um, are there any specific challenges or unique considerations that comes to diagnosing or treating a hereditary cancer compared to a non-hereditary form? Yes. Like, is it, does it look different? It looks different. And, but 25 years ago, we didn't know that. Huh. And it's only because of the research that we've done. Right. And we've led a lot of that at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, looking at how to best treat these patients. So by collecting data from women all over the world with these BRCA1 and 2 mutations, we now know that these women should be treated differently. They should have a bilateral mastectomy, which is going to reduce their risk of dying by half. They should have their ovaries removed, again, reducing their risk of dying. So what we've tried to do now is integrate this into the whole cancer journey for these women. So at the time that they're diagnosed with breast cancer, they have a genetic test done. We use that information to help women make decisions about the treatment that's going to be best for them. So it's really personalizing the treatment for the best outcomes for that individual woman. And it's, it's really interesting how fast things have moved because when oh, I worked for the Cancer fast, Society, yes. it wasn't like, yes. we weren't there yet. Yes. I mean, it wasn't 25 years ago, but it was quite some time yeah, ago. No. So it's nice to see no. that. And it, it really speaks to the importance of research and uh, the Canadian Cancer Society has been excellent in funding a lot of our research into these areas. So uh, we're thankful for that because we couldn't do research without the funding which is part of leaving a legacy, yes. is that funding piece. So can you discuss the importance of genetic testing and counseling for individuals with a family history of hereditary cancers? And as yeah. just someone who's watching this, like how would you even know if you yeah. need to start looking into this? And I think it goes beyond those typical families that we used to see when we first started doing this, that it was so obvious that there was something 
hereditary going on. We're now able to test any individual. So you don't have to have a family history of cancer. You can decide, I want to know this information. Do I have a mutation in one of these cancer predisposition genes? We often see families that there are very few women or someone is estranged from their family and they don't know what's, what's happening in terms of family history of cancer or they were adopted. So there are so many different circumstances which lowers the chance that someone's going to meet the eligibility criteria and we know they're not perfect, these criteria for testing. So if, you know, if I could look into the future and see what I wanted to see happen, it would be that anybody can access this genetic testing if they want it. And how much is it if you wanted to, if you don't meet the criteria and you if still you want to access? If you don't meet the access? criteria, we are doing a study at Women's College Hospital where any Canadian 18 years of age or older can have genetic testing and the cost is $250 American to have that test done. It, it, it's sort of, you think about it like, is it $250 for peace of mind or? Yeah, to know that you're not at risk is yeah. peace of mind or to know that yes, okay, I am at risk. I now have this information. I can do something for myself, but I can also now, because that, that same genetic mutation is passed down from generation to generation. So now all of my relatives can also be tested for free for that same genetic mutation. And we can work with everybody to make sure that that happens with appropriate genetic counseling, referrals to the right specialists. They can get involved in more vigilant screening, so breast screening, or elect for a preventive surgery as well. And what advice would you give to someone who might be thinking, I'd rather just not know because there's that surprise element too yeah. in balancing the knowledge is power with, oh God, yes. do I really want to know this? And it is a very individual decision and no two people come with the same circumstances or experiences. So making that decision is very individual. But what I can say is we've made such progress in 25 years and we have options now. We have, it's not like what I said was like 25 years ago. If we tell you you're at this high risk, we will give you options. This is what we're going to do with you to help you manage that risk. Right. And so when you look to the future, what are some of the areas of research or emerging technologies that you believe hold great potential for the prevention and treatment mm -hmm. of hereditary mm -hmm. cancers? Because Sometimes I feel like cancer research is this like big black box that we don't all get to look into and we don't really yeah. know what's happening. So what do you see coming down the pipeline? I mean, in terms of genetics, like I said, I, I think I would want everyone to have access to this if they would, if they would like it. Mm -hmm. But we're also seeing now some of the pharmaceutical companies that are targeting drugs that target these specific types of cancer. And we're seeing excellent um, results because of we're, we're leveraging this genetic information to make treatment decisions that's, that's going to have an impact on an individual's life in terms of prolonging life, uh, reducing the risk that that cancer ever comes back. And I have a last question for you just yeah. to wrap this up. Um, we always talk about healthy lifestyles and how healthy lifestyles mm -hmm. can help to prevent cancer. Does that even play a role when it comes to hereditary cancers? It does, but it's, it's such a small role. Right. I mean, if you are born with this genetic predisposition, there's very little that you can do to eliminate eating that 80% risk. Eating an apple isn't going to stop it. It's not yeah. going to stop it <laughs> okay. by eating an apple. But that's not to say that a healthy lifestyle isn't important for so many other things that you need to think about when you're thinking about your health. So that's why we work very closely with these individuals, because nobody is really told in their lifetime that they have an 80% risk of anything. Right. So to be told you have an 80% risk of developing breast cancer, that's serious. Yeah. And we wanna make sure that that woman minimizes the chance that she will ever get breast cancer. Well, thank you. And thank you for shedding some light on what's been happening in the cancer research world. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you too. We've talked a lot today about family, but what if you want to look further back than your parents? Alison Lowe is the country manager of Ancestry Canada and is joined by video link here with her colleague in London, Laura House, who is one of Ancestry's pro genealogists. Welcome to you both. Thank you, great to be here. Hello, Laura, it's nice to see you. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you. So I'm gonna start by asking the first question, how can exploring one's family tree contribute to leaving a meaningful legacy for future generations? So we just talked about more the medical side of things, but what else can knowing our background and our genetics tell us that will help us leave a legacy? 
Um, I've had the benefit of listening to everyone kind of talk about what legacy means, and I think really the entire offering of doing family history research and DNA testing is everything that we've been talking about today. Um, leaving a, le a legacy, you know, you really have to think about what is your personal identity, um, how do you connect to other people, and what's your sense of belonging in the world, and those are all benefits that Ancestry gives you. Um, so if you think about the way that you approach family history research, a lot of people just think family tree. Mm -hmm. That's often a starting point, and doing a DNA test can open that door if you don't have as much information about how to start your family tree. But the primary benefit of Ancestry is that access to tens of billions of global digitized records where you're operational in 84 countries across the world wow. were truly global. So the likelihood of you finding information and stitching that story together in your family history research through any kinds of records, whether they be birth, marriage, death, census, um, is all something that you can share, you know, to connect with existing family members or preserve and share, you know, afterwards as part of your living legacy. And I'll talk a little bit more later about real customers that experience that every day. Yeah, and it, it, um, it makes me think, like sometimes I think to myself, you know, we all have Instagram and Facebook now, and like I think, you know, my son will be able to show his kids, like this is what your grandma was like when she was crazy. You That's know, just terrifying. Like, <laughs> you know, it is, but it, it's going to exist um, unless Instagram disappears. Uh, and so then, what are some of the success stories um, that Ancestry has uncovered in terms of, you know, because I'm sure we've all heard the not success stories where it's like, we found out this person murdered someone in 1940 thanks to like a DNA test. But, you know, are there some like great stories um, that you've uncovered through your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll talk about a couple of Canadian customers um, who, one, the first person that I'll talk about, the only information that he really had to start out with was his paternal great-grandfather's name. Okay. Um, but he was this very vibrant musical theater actor and musician and instructor, and he really wanted to find out more because he had that kind of arts and culture thread running throughout his family. And a remarkable story in terms of um, his great-grandfather's family escaping from the US via the Underground Railroad to wow. get into Canada and um, had a family of eight and they had this troop of Jubilee singers and were really rooted in the communities that they lived in in Canada and you know that really cemented his sense of identity and the legacy that he thought he w was living and encouraged him to um, continue his passion for black activism, which is something that he discovered his family was very invested in and affirmed all of the choices that he had made, because as you can imagine, being um, a musical theater actor might be very difficult at times, yeah. but having that connection and resilience to generations of your family that had lived and endured through really difficult times is just such an amazing feeling and something that a lot of customers talk about as a benefit because we're living in really turbulent, uncertain times. And it's always really reassuring, I think, to know that you do have people that preceded you, that survived, that thrived, and you know went through really difficult times as well. It, um, it, yeah, and it must have been reinforcing to him to know that the things that I hold close to my heart came from somewhere. Exactly. Um, and another customer that I'll speak about quite briefly, he, again, only really knew his paternal grandfather's name, but it was more complicated in terms of the situation and his motivation for getting started because he had known that his paternal um grandfather had abandoned his father's family, and his father was in his 90s at this point. And um, through ancestry, they discovered, the family discovered that the grandfather had an entire other family in the UK that none of their family members had any idea existed, and they discovered that he had a half-brother wow. that was very close in age to him, 
that they were able to organize a reunion for them and give their father, who you know, likely didn't have much time left, the gift of understanding his family legacy. And they did develop a relationship as a result of that. And those kinds of ex like really life-changing experiences do happen to real people all the time. That's a pretty beautiful story. And I'll have you back on another show so we can talk about like the murder <laughs> and the, the other well, side of it. Well, maybe that can segue into, because I know pri <laughs> privacy is a big question that we it get is. asked all the time. And yeah. the reality is that unless there's a like, legitimate legal process right. and we're being served with a warrant that has been verified by, by our corporate legal team, we, your, your DNA is your DNA. Right. Ancestry has no ownership over it. If you decide, for example, to do the test and receive your results and have them destroyed, we will destroy them. Okay. Well, that's good to know because I'm sure the ethical considerations are some things that people do think a lot about. But I did want to talk about um, the process for testing and ask Laura what that process is and how can Ancestry's platform and resources help individuals discover and document their family stories? So how does the whole process work? Right, so I have a DNA kit here, so I can do a little demonstration for you if you like. Um, don't worry, I won't actually be spitting because that would be gross. But I have a kit here. This is what the box looks like. And inside the sleeve, you have all the instructions as well. So when you receive your kit, you'll have all the instructions right there, makes it very simple. And then inside, you have the tube with the funnel for spitting into. And you have a bag to put the tube into, because of course it's biohazard. And this is a prepaid uh, postage box that you then send back to Ancestry's lab. So you don't need to pay for postage. You pop your sample into the box and you just stick it in the post box and it goes straight there. And this is the tube and you spit into the tube and it looks like a really massive tube, but actually the bottom of the tube is here and you only need to fill it to here. <laughs> so it's a tiny, tiny amount of saliva. So it looks daunting, but it's actually not very much. And what I would say is if you do struggle to produce the correct amount, because sometimes people are on medication, so they have a dry mouth or you can have a dry mouth for any number of reasons. Um, I recommend cutting open, open a lemon and snipping the lemon and it really helps to get the saliva flowing. And then you can produce enough to get into the uh, tube, which we had to do with my grandmother, who's 93. And we were sat there with the lemon and she was sniffing the lemon, spitting into the tube. And at one point she licked the lemon and we said, Nan, don't lick the lemon. That's not what it's for. But she meant well, she was just trying. And then you have this lid here and this contains the DNA preservation fluid. So once you're done with the spitting, you take the funnel off you pop the lid on and you squeeze it really tight until it snaps and the fluid goes into the tube. And that preserves your sample so it can survive the journey back to the lab. And you shake it all up, make sure it's really well mixed, put it into the bag, put the bag into the box and post it back. And in terms of your legacy, DNA is in so many ways the very essence of who we are. And just by taking the test, you're preserving that information. You're preserving a huge part of yourself and your heritage and where you come from. And I've tested myself, my parents and my grandparents. And just knowing that when they're not around anymore, I'm still going to have that. It's just such an incredibly, it's a wonderful thing and a personal thing. And to know that, that their contribution to the database and to my personal family history research is always going to be there so that I can keep building the story and learning more about our family. It's such a wonderful thing. And um, as Alison was saying, we've got a database of over 30 billion records. So you can research your ancestors all over the world and learn their stories and pass those stories down to your children and your grandchildren. Thank you. And for the last question, so once that test is, is sent, so what are the unique features or tools within Ancestry's platform that can assist individuals in creating that comprehensive and vis visually appealing record of their family history as a legacy? Like, what does it look like once the results come through? Um, we weren't able to show actual screenshots, but right. uh, within the platform itself, it is a, like it's a visual record so you get so you get a percentage breakdown Laura you can chime in at any any point if you wish but um so you get on your maternal side and your paternal side a breakdown of the percentages of the regions both of your parents came from right. so in my case um I was just expecting like what am I going to learn I know that both of my parents uh even though they have complex migration patterns 
are Chinese. Mm -hmm. But actually, it did, it was quite surprising in terms of what my assumptions were even regionally right. throughout China and what I saw in the results. Um, and Laura also has extremely interesting DNA results that I think she can speak to in terms of what she learned. Yeah, so I absolutely love my DNA results. And um, when I took my DNA test, it um, one of the most interesting things for me was that it confirmed a rumor that my father had Jewish heritage. And actually, as well as your ethnicity estimate, you also get um, a list of all the people in the database with whom you share DNA. So these are your genetic relatives. And through this, I connected with a cousin from the Jewish side of my family who had inherited all the family photographs. And that was just the most incredible, one of the happiest days ever. And um, it's just amazing to be able to connect with your relatives, to hear the stories that they have inherited that you might not have had passed down to you. And also by connecting with your relatives, by seeing that you share DNA with your relatives, you confirm huge chunks of your family tree. Sometimes you confirm that bits of your tree aren't correct, which is equally as important for making sure you're actually handing down the correct legacy and accurate legacy. So the magic of DNA is in the scientific accuracy of it and knowing that what you're then passing down to your descendants is the, the truth of their heritage. Thank you for that. And thank you both for joining me today. The final destination of life, and there's no avoiding it, is death. But we rarely speak openly about it. And according to our next guest, that should change. Yvonne Heath is a nurse turned author and the founder of Love Your Life to Death, teaching people to prepare for and navigate grief, transitions, and end of life. Thank you for joining us, Yvonne. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. But I have a lot of work to do, estate planning, and need to learn more about probate, yeah. genetic testing, and do you, ancestry. Do you have a will? Of course. Okay, then I you're. Can't be, yes, I do. That's the oh. first step. That is the first step. And I'm excited to be talking to you today because when I had first approached my producer about doing this this mini series for me, I, I said to her, "I'm obsessed with death," and mm. she said, "That's weird." <laughs> and I said, "I know, but it's really important, and people don't like to talk about it." And you wrote an entire book about it. Here's yes. my Oprah move again. <laughs> so what inspired you to focus on helping prepare for and navigate grief transitions and end of life? Oh, that's very easy. My own excessive suffering as a nurse for 27 years. Right. And as many people can relate, I pretended I was fine when I wasn't many times. I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Often I didn't know what to do and I didn't know what to say. And so I pretended I was strong and right, trying to help everyone else. And then I went home and suffered and um, often drank a little too much red wine to numb the pain. Mm -hmm. And I started having conversations with other healthcare professionals. Like, are we well prepared for grief, death, dying, transitions, all of that? And they're like, oh no, we're terrible at it. And I said, well, who's, who's helping community to have these conversations to perhaps be proactive instead of reactive? And everyone's like, I have no idea. Just, I don't know, go, go start that IV. I don't want to talk about this. Okay. And so I suffered and I witnessed many people suffering as well. And so what are some of the common misconceptions or fears that people have when it comes to discussing or preparing for end of life matters? And, and have you found ways to address this so that it's an easier conversation to have? Well, we say easier or people say, I want it to be comfortable. It isn't comfortable. So if we can accept that, number one, um, and I always talk about the elephant in the room. Everyone wants to tell themselves that they have time and, oh, I'm too young to have this conversation. And I say, oh my God, I'm sorry to be the one to let you know we don't all die of old age yeah. and we don't always get a warning, mm -hmm. right? And so to think that you have time and that's something you should do later is one <laughs> big misconception. And the other thing is, if we think about it, if we talk about it before, we can bring in heart, humor, and humanness and banter and you know instead of I mean people say I don't want to talk about it we will have to talk about it either before or in a crisis which will be better right so if you prepare before and I mean it's been we've many of your guests talked about families are fractured beyond repair there's fights about finances or there's one ring and three people want it like why not have those conversations before it doesn't have to be morbid right and I think it's sort of like accepting that it's going to happen. It's, um, 
it's like a prenup. Like a prenup is you do it before you get married because maybe you'll get divorced. But unfortunately, end of life planning is important because you will die. It's 100% true. As far as I know. <laughs> yes. And here's the thing though, right? Like when I, when I do a keynote or a training or something and I say, you know, who's afraid of death and who doesn't want to talk about it and who, who doesn't want to die? And never, oh, I don't want to die. And I said like, who wants to live forever? Not me. Like, doesn't that sound exhausting? It does. You know, how long I'm have you been married? Now. Like 299 <laughs> years. I mean, of course not. We are all here for as long as we're here. Life is unpredictable. Prepare for anything and change is the only constant. So let's live the heck out of this life and plan our life and our death. And we can create a sense of peace and meaning during the end of life journey. So what are some effective ways to do that, both for the individual and their loved ones? Although I do feel like as an individual, when you're heading towards that, when you're heading towards that stage of your life, you, I think, start to come to terms with it. I feel like it's harder for, you know, there's that meme that's like, what, what's the similarity, similarity between stupidity and death? It's, it's hard for everyone around you, not so much for yourself. Absolutely. So I can tell you that in, I think, 15 years that I worked in chemotherapy, many patients came to me and said, I don't want this chemotherapy anymore. I don't want this blood transfusion. I don't mm -hmm. want this therapy. And I would literally say like this, please, please have this conversation with your family and your doctor. Please let them know how you feel. And they're like, no, they don't want me to give up because they see death as failure. And, and we're, we're conditioned to believe with our medical technology is wonderful. And it's also, you know, it's caused a lot of, we can cure death, we can avoid death at all costs. So that isn't, most people that are dying know that they are dying and they're continuing to take all these treatments for their families. So what if again, we could create change and have those conversations throughout life mm -hmm. and we can create complete and total change. We can create precious moments along the way instead of living for that next transfusion, for that chemotherapy. And, and again, just be together in that time. Yeah, because longevity is important, but the quality of your life during that longevity piece is also very important. And I think it's something we all need to keep in mind. So what resources or tools do you recommend for individuals who want to proactively plan for their end of life preferences and ensure their wishes are honored? Because that's, the, that's really the key, is that you wanna make sure that the people around you know what you would want when you're not there. So they're not making their own decisions willy nilly. Absolutely. So, well, first thing, obviously, they need to read my book. Yes. <laughs> well, because, well, when I, when I took that leap and left nursing and I started interviewing many people, ages 11 to 101, it changed my life in hearing their stories. And, you know, I want people to be compassionate with themselves. Like, we've normalized not talking about this. Yes. So, so, so changing that is going to be uncomfortable. Lean in, there are many resources, and that's why I created the website, loveyourlifetodeath.com. I have many resources that, besides my book and my talk, my, talk, my TED Talk and everything. Um, but if you educate yourself first, start with yourself, right? And, and just know that all you can do is the best you can do. I mean, it's kind of like labor, right? I had this beautiful birth plan, like doves were gonna fly and music, and it was gonna be so amazing. Did it go that way? Not at all, okay, not even checking. remotely. <laughs> But for those nine months, that gave me comfort, right? right? So, so we can plan the end of our life as, as well as we can. Those around us can honor us as best as, as they can. And just know that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. Is it gonna all be that way? Really? Are there glitches in life? Yes. Usually. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And so just knowing that we can honor each other and ourselves as best as we can. And again, allow for that heart, humor, and humanness along the way. I say humor with everything, even, oh. even death. I, I actually, unfortunately, have the role in my family of MC for all funerals. Excellent. Um, and uh, I've been told many times, please don't make too many jokes. This is a funeral. Oh. But like when I pass, I want there to be a lot of jokes. Absolutely. Like and not about me. Oh, okay, maybe a little bit about me, but you know. <laughs> well, and here's the thing about it, and it's funny because I, I am continuously learning, unlearning, and evolving. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do. And what I've learned is that grief is like our internal reaction to loss, transitions, change, whatever we makes our heart ache. Mourning is that external expression. It may be crying and it may be laughing, right? You're you could be, I said. 
in all of these transitions, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm sappy, I'm crying one moment, I'm laughing. Laughter is great. Laughter is a part of it all. Like, and I said, at my funeral and vis visitation, I want everyone to be absolutely destroyed and bawling their eyes out and laughing yeah. and saying how hilarious I was because I'm really funny. And I, I think want you're hilarious, all, right? just like me. I'm the funniest person I know. Well, exactly, <laughs> I know. That's why we're gonna be really good friends. <laughs> but you know, like, let's have it all. Let's allow all emotion. Yeah. Let's allow all reaction. And everyone will react differently and that's okay too. But let's talk about it throughout life, right? right? So you talk a lot about legacy mindset. So can you discuss that concept and how it can shape an individual's approach to life, grief, and end of life? Like I think the way you and I look at death is probably different than most people. Mm -hmm. So how do we get more people on our side? So on here's, our team. Yeah, on our team. So the first thing I believe is that we need to teach by example, right? Like, so we have to die? No, no, no. <laughs> Normalize these yeah. conversations, right? Normalize these conversations throughout life, live our best life. And like when I'm going out again, I will not talk to anybody about anything I haven't done, right? And it's funny because I, I talk a lot about our, our twins, Jaden and Tana, who are now 18, were nine when I was writing my book. And I say they were kind of like our experiment because I've normalized these conversations with them. Mm -hmm. And my greatest thing is that they just turned 18 and they did their power of attorneys. Wow. Right? For personal care and well, you know, property, like, well, you have a guitar, Tanner, and these, but like to just normalize, yeah. let's do that. And let's do that throughout life. And I say like every year we look at our power of attorney and our will at tax time and we normalize that we just address it or when there's a change. And um, let's just start, there's a lot of damage control with, like you say, how do we get everybody to do this? There's a lot of people that see the title of my book and run the other way. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this. And I say, well, that's why I had a book to write. So we won't change everyone, right. but we can teach by our own example and normalize those conversations in our families as much as we can. Well, thank you so much. I mean, your book is great, and I do recommend everyone read it. And I think we'll be able to change the world. Just one, one conversation at a time. Thank you so much. Thank you. What is the best way to honor a life lived and a legacy left? The communal gathering after a death can set the tone. We're now joined by Calvin Carter. Calvin is a sales manager for Greater Toronto with Dignity Memorial, North America's largest provider of funeral, cremation, and cemetery services. Welcome, Calvin. Thank you for having me, Natasha. Thank you for joining me. I really enjoyed our pre-meeting, and I think we're going to get into some interesting things, because you really opened my eyes to what a funeral can be be because I mean as someone who's unfortunately attended a lot they're often quite somber and sad and mm -hmm. void of sparkle and glitter and cats and horses and all the things you said I can have at my funeral <laughs> yeah. so can you talk about some of the funeral cremation and cemetery services available and how they can contribute to the legacy individuals leave behind absolutely such a great question I think 30, 40 years ago, everybody had a mindset of to what a funeral is. Yes. Uh, thankfully, things have evolved over the last several decades, and there's so many new opportunities that we can present to our families to ensure that their legacy is honored exactly as they would. And that all begins with the conversation. Uh, if we can begin by starting with what the different options that are available to them, the easier that process will be for them. And this might be a strange question, but when do people start? You're like, all these questions are going to be strange for sure. <laughs> no, no such thing in my world. <laughs> so when do people start having these conversations with you? Like, would it be weird if I drove up to Dignity Memorial today and said, hey, Calvin, let's plan my funeral? Not at all. In fact, all of our conversations that we have with our community members is to start the conversation as early as possible. Right. Benefits when you pre-plan is you have the ability to make changes down the line. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when we start these conversations, we think of what the funeral would be at today. Unfortunately, we just went through several years where we were told we can't have these kinds of funerals. And so we make modifications as we go through that process with them. Um, but ultimately, our job is to provide the information to them. And do you have a lot of people doing that? We Just do, Just driving yes. up and saying, let's plan my funeral? Absolutely. And there is no age barrier. Right. Um, I've always been the biggest advocate to start the conversation now, mm -hmm. and the sooner the better. Again, you can get your feedback from your family members as opposed to, God forbid, facing with that sudden death. Or if you have now a terminal illness, you're no longer thinking as you normally yeah. would. 
And so I, I kind of was a little tongue in cheek when I talked about animals at my funeral, <laughs> but not really. So what are some of the unique or innovative services offered in the industry to help individuals create that personalized and memorable farewell for their loved ones? Absolutely. So we always encourage personalization and making services unique. You no longer have to wear a three-piece suit to a funeral. Uh, if you want to have everyone wearing hockey jerseys, uh, perhaps you may want to have your emotional support horse, cat, or yes. dog yeah. uh, present at the service because that was unique to you. We can do that. A new term that we constantly talk about now is celebration of life. Yes. And really making it unique to those that we serve. And what does that celebration of life look to me? Perhaps maybe we want some spirits, wine, or, or perhaps a toast at the end of our service. All things that we can do now. Tell us about the slot machine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we had a, a family. Uh, Mum was an avid gambler, uh, mm -hmm. liked to spend her time with scratch tickets and at the casino. Uh, so the family had rented out a slot machine. Everybody who came into the visitation got an opportunity to pull down on that big slot arm. And uh, at the bottom of the tray was a poker chip that they all got to take with a, a final goodbye uh, from mom. So it was really unique and special. And I tell you, there was a lineup for everyone to pull that arm. And it probably adds a little bit of that humor piece too, you know, because we all, I mean, let's be honest, the person's already gone. So let's try and make it a little lighter if we can. Funerals are for the living, not those who have passed away. Is my mom shaking her head behind me? <laughs> a little bit, but we okay. won't talk about okay. that. <laughs> so how can you ensure that your arrangements are honored? So let's say I drive up and I plan the most obscure funeral and then I pass not too long after. How do I make sure that what I've asked you to do is actually done and my husband doesn't come in and say, nope, we're doing a, Buddh a Buddhist funeral and everyone must be crying? That is a terrific question. Yeah. Um, so the benefit when you plan ahead is your family are going to know those are the wishes that you wanted, and they're going to honor and respect that with respects to what they were looking at hoping of having as well, too. Um, when you have those conversations ahead of time and we start planning for what is really important to us, our goal and our objective is not to keep that within ourselves, but to share that with our friends and family so they know that we've done this as a gift to them so that most difficult time in their life is a little bit easier. And I want to touch on cultural, religious traditions. So, you know, I think we're seeing now with our generation, the generation after us, we're, like, we're starting to lose a bit of the culture that a lot of our parents who, you know, may have immigrated here or, or really held to their religion and culture, mm -hmm. a lot of it's starting to get lost as the generations, you mm -hmm. know, start to get a little bit more free with their thinking. <laughs> right. and so um, how do you support someone? So say someone comes and their parent was very religious and they want to give them that religious funeral. Are you able to provide support so that they know what they should be doing? Because we're not taught these customs. Exactly, and a, a very fair point. Um, we educate our families on what can be done. Um, with speaking to religion and cultural and norms, um, there are things that have shifted over the years where now we'll have clergy that are coming into the funeral where previously maybe we always go out to, to a church or a place of worship. Um, so a lot of the changes and evolutions as we go through funeral services, there are a lot of members in our community that are also changing their vision and their focus with that as well too. So being able to maybe host everything at one of our funeral or life celebration centers as opposed to having to go out to that church and keeping everything nice and central. And I've been hearing a lot more about mobile cremations and I'm not saying, I don't think that means like a truck that's driving around cremating people, <laughs> I don't think, but I think it means you're able to have your funeral at a location and then maybe the service for cremation is then provided by yourselves. Like, do you, mm -hmm. do, is that something that you do, like, sort of, or do, like, off site celebrations and yes. then bring the body without making it too gory, you know, for the cremation part? Yes, and, and that's a very good point. A very close colleague of mine knows he wants to have his service at his golf club. Right. Um, do they know that? <laughs> his family does okay. know that. And, and we've made the arrangements to make sure that is so. Um, the first thing we want to do is making sure we're following all of the procedures in terms of the legislation as well as the law. Yes. Um, we don't want to be driving around, like you said, that truck, that mobile yeah. service. Hopefully that's not a real uh, thing. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we really focus on how we can make this unique for the loved one and right. for their families as well too. So if that means having that gathering or celebration of life outside of what we would refer to as a norm, absolutely we can make those accommodations to make it happen. Okay. Um, 
can you share any heartwarming or inspiring stories of families who have utilized funeral cremation or cemetery services to create that meaningful tribute? So I already stole your slot machine stories. So I'm hoping <laughs> you have another one. I do, <laughs> yes. The benefit of working in the funeral home is no two days are alike. Right. Um, we have had families have as simple as bringing in unique flowers. Perhaps mom loved Gerber daisies or calla lilies or maybe a specific song. Um, we've had big biker groups that have brought in ACDC as, as their funeral music. That is totally acceptable. I heard it once um, of a funeral that someone said I walked in and I felt like I was at a nightclub. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like the person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. And, and that's the nice thing is it makes us as a reflection of who we were and the legacy that we're leaving for our families. Um, but a specific instance that comes to mind is a family bringing in dad's four-wheeler. Um, and they placed his urn at the front of the chapel with his four-wheeler. At the end, they got to ride it out, and his grandson rode out with his urn sitting in his lap. So, That's so many beautiful. unique. As long as it's within the law, we will do our best to accommodate. And if we pay extra, you'll do things outside of the law. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Or things we can discuss <laughs> on the show, at least. Okay, yeah. yeah. When the cameras are off. Yeah, exactly. So what options are available for individuals who maybe want a more eco-friendly or sustainable funeral um, that aligns with leaving a green legacy? And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I don't even know what that could look like. That is a good question, and you're right. It's still relatively new to our profession into the bereavement sector. Um, there are a variety of different ways that can be done, whether that be the specific interment spot of, uh, of the deceased, or perhaps it may be turning your cremated remains into a tree. Um, we have this really neat program where you input a postal code as to where you'd like a tree interred with your cremated remains, and they'll make a recommendation of a few different options as to the type of tree or species that would thrive well in that area. Okay, so I don't want a tree, but I'll tell you what I do want. <laughs> and we talked about this, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure everyone knows you can do this, but you can turn ashes into a diamond. You can, yes. So do you, do you do that? That's a great question. <laughs> so we work with a, a third-party company to assist us in that process. Um, but what we do is we take a sample of the cremator remains and we send this to the company. And they'll design a ring based or a ring or a piece of jewelry, anything into the diamond that you'd like. You can even say the size, uh, the cut, the clarity, they'll decide that. As we talk now is very common, uh, lab-grown diamonds, very nice. similar in that sense. And is that something that people are doing a lot? Is it popular? It is becoming more popular as people learn about it. Because I'm talking it. about yeah, it exactly. more, that's why. It's exactly. because of me, they should give me money for this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanna talk a little bit about grief. Mm -hmm. And so how does the, the funeral sort of industry support yes. those in grief? I've done some work with hospice, so we all know like we have hospices and communities across this country and they all provide grief counseling. So do you partner with hospice? Do you provide your own? counseling, mm -hmm. like how do you support that process? Such a good question. Um, so at Dignity, our services do not end the day of the funeral. We continue our relationship with okay. all of our families um, through our aftercare program. So we assist families with settling mm -hmm. of some of the estate paperwork such as Canada Pension. Okay. And then we also work with an association called Charles Netchum for our Compassion Helpline. It's a 24-7, 365 over the phone consultation that our families and friends can utilize after the services. Uh, not only that, our team is constantly in communication with our families just to make sure that they're getting along okay after the services, as well as make sure we're doing our follow-up and our due diligence. And so, where does one start? So you, when we met earlier, um, you had this really amazing handbook. So can yes. you talk a little? I don't have it with me because <laughs> it's all folded up and looks terrible now because I've been going through it. So tell me about this handbook and how mm. people can actually start this proactive planning without Absolutely. actually driving up to Dignity Memorial. <laughs> Absolutely. So what you're referring to is called our personal planning guide. It's a comprehensive journal that answers questions A to Z in all aspects of funeral and goes beyond much more than just the funeral services and it actually discusses about estate planning as well. Okay. So when someone passes away, on average, it's about 150 questions that a funeral director will have to ask a family under a very emotional and difficult time. Right. This journal is going to speak for you when you're no longer able to speak for yourself. And the other thing I wanted to ask about was, you know, sometimes we don't have a financial legacy to leave. Mm -hmm. um, but I have heard there's programs and supports in place so that, is it true that every Canadian will get some sort of a funeral or like a casket, you know, just the mm -hmm. things to ensure that there's some dignity, even if you don't have that financial support. Absolutely. So we work with all of our government, municipal, provincial, and federal to ensure that the services of the decedent is looked after with the utmost care and integrity. 
Um, but one of the benefits of when you pre-plan your services is you can actually secure what the current pricing was. So I always like to say, if I could go back 20 years ago and prepay for my gas, right. I would probably do yes. that. Um, so when you, when you pre-arrange, you actually get a lock-in at what today's current pricing structure. Okay. And what's different from at the time of need is you're not required to pay for everything in full. You can actually amortize it over a period of time. And we've partnered with a really great insurance company mm -hmm. so that, God forbid, something happened to you while you were making those payments, the remaining balance of your services is actually covered. Oh, wow. And one of the things I, I know about you is that you are a second generation funeral director. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes kids say, I don't want to, like I think of my own son who looks at the farm my husband runs and says, there's no way I want to run that greenhouse. Mm -hmm. But you did not say that. <laughs> you said, I do want to run the greenhouse. Yeah. And so why? Why did you decide to stay in the industry? So I had an opportunity where I looked after a very near dear friend of mine uh, in looking after their services. Uh, professionally, one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, the arrangements took us nearly seven hours. Um, so I was put in this position where it was very difficult professionally as well as mm -hmm. personally having that relationship. It was at that point I knew that everybody had to have some form of, of plan regardless of what that is. And we've heard from so many great speakers already, let's just have the conversation and talk about it, right? Because that's the most difficult part. Oftentimes, the feedback we receive from our families after the arrangements are in place, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right. And so I do want to end by asking, what is your story and your legacy? And, and for you, I also want to know, is there anything interesting or unique that you're hoping your loved ones do to honor you? Well, that's a very good question, Natasha. It's actually a conversation in my household that's always evolving. I'm sure. Because <laughs> my, my fiance and I, we have two different takes onto what a funeral would actually look like. Right. Um, so, so the legacy I want to leave behind is that I'm there to service my community. Uh, I want to be a member and a pillar in my community, knowing that people can always come to us mm -hmm. and to support through our Dignity Funeral Homes uh, and making sure that we're always there to help people. And is there anything fun or interesting that you're going to do? You know I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> of course. Um, we're going to see as technology develops as to what that looks like. Um, but currently, no, no crazy plans other than I don't want anyone wearing a suit to my funeral. I like it. But there might be a robot there. That's yeah, what I'm exactly. thinking. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much, Calvin. Thank you. That wraps up today's program and our Life to Legacy Explained series. We hope we've left you more informed and better inspired to take steps now to invest in your longevity, your comfort as you age, and the legacy you leave behind. You can watch this show again or the other episodes in the series by simply visiting everythingexplained.ca. Signing off from the Zoomerplex in Toronto, I'm Natasha Ray.